So yesterday we got a little bit more familiar with the concept of enthalpy, the change in heat content in a chemical reaction. And uh, now we're going to look at how enthalpy fits into balanced chemical equations to make what we would call thermochemical equations. And uh, this is where this is where your delta H value really shows up and uh, gets used a lot. So this is toward the end of your 6.2 notes. And I'm going to kick it off with this. If a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen is ignited, water will form and heat energy will be released explosively. The heat that is released comes from the reactants as they form products. Because heat is released, the reaction is exothermic and the heat content of the products must be less than the heat content of the reactants. And that's kind of going back to where we ended the class yesterday over here and we've got like the course of the reaction here we're starting out with more energy and going down to less energy the products and our change in enthalpy is that value right there so we're just saying that a combustion reaction involving hydrogen and oxygen is an exothermic reaction the following chemical equation for this reaction indicates that two moles of hydrogen gas react with one mole of oxygen gas to produce two moles of water vapor. This equation does not tell you that heat is evolved. This reaction. The balance equation doesn't tell you that there's heat there. Heat evolved, heat released, heat given off. Experiments have shown that 483 kilojoules of heat are evolved when two moles of water are formed from its elements at room temperature. Modifying the chemical equation to show the amount of heat produced in the reaction gives the following chemical expression. So this is maybe one way that we could show that energy is being produced. We take the uh, energy produced when two moles of hydrogen, or excuse me, two moles of water are produced, and we throw that heat energy over here because we know heat's a product of this reaction. It's something that's given off with the products, and uh, we know the magnitude of that. However, that's really not the way that we write a thermochemical equation. What we typically do is include the delta H value, the change in enthalpy value. So the proper way to show this type of information would be to have the equation. And instead of doing the plus uh, 483, we're going to do a delta H off to the side. And because it's an exothermic reaction, we're going to put a sign there to indicate that the energy is being given off. So when we take a balanced chemical equation and we slap on the delta H value that goes with it, then this becomes a thermal chemical. I only showed the 483 kilojoules of energy here on the product side just because in first year chemistry, when we talk about energy going into a reaction or out of a reaction, and maybe even a couple times this year, we just put the energy on the left for endo or the energy on the right for exo. But um, moving forward, changing the enthalpy off to the side of the equation is the proper way to show that. Any thermochemical equation when we look at the uh, coefficients, we must interpret the numbers as moles of molecules. So when we look at the uh, balanced equation here, for example, 
the magnitude of the energy that's given off is assuming that it's two moles of H2 molecules, one mole of O2 molecules making two moles of water, and that's the energy when the mole to mole to mole ratio is true. If we are doing just two individual molecules and one molecule and two molecules, that would be an incredibly small number, probably measured in something in joules and millijoules or microjoules or nanojoules, but it would be a really small amount if we were talking about individual particles. So the coefficients represent moles and the energy that we get corresponds with those mole to mole to mole ratios. Then it's also true that producing twice as much water vapor would require twice as many moles of reactants and it would release twice as much heat energy. So the thermochemical equation, if we doubled everything up, would be something like this. We'd have four moles of hydrogen gas reacting with two moles of O2 gas, making four moles of water vapor, and our delta H would have to be adjusted accordingly, and it would go up and be double that 483 that we had before. Because now the equation is saying four moles of this reacts with two moles of this to produce four moles of that, and there's going to be more energy involved with that. Likewise, and this actually happens quite frequently, producing half as much water would require one half as many moles of reactants and pr produces only one half as much heat, and that would look where we actually use a fraction for a coefficient. Original equation, which would be 241.5. Fractions in thermochemistry are actually pretty common for the coefficients. Um, you'll see a lot more of that in the next lessons that, that follow this, but um, that's actually kind of fairly common, if not almost normal, in thermal chemistry. But half as much, half as much energy produced. So don't be bothered by fractional coefficients. They're pretty frequent in this section. The situation is reversed in endothermic reactions. Because in this case, the products have a higher heat content than the reactants. We just referred back to uh, what we were doing yesterday. I'll squeeze that in the corner here. We got some energy and time over here. And in an endothermic reaction, we're going this way where the products have more energy to add energy or absorb energy to make that happen. So if you took the same reaction as up above, the water uh, forming reaction, and we flipped it, the decomposition of water vapor is endothermic. It is a reverse of the reaction that forms water vapor. This is expected because the difference between the heat content of the reactants and the products is unchanged. So the thermochemical equation for the decomposition of water would be written something like this. Um, we're going back to the original equation. Instead of producing two moles of water, we're going to decompose two moles of water into two moles of hydrogen gas. Because we reverse the reaction, same magnitude of number there. But it's going to have the opposite sign because we reverse the reaction. 
So we can use our delta H, adjust it up and down if we're doubling or halving our coefficients or tripling our coefficients or quadrupling them, whatever. Um, we reverse the equation. We always reverse the sign on our delta H. Reactions can be run in the forward or the reverse direction. Uh, sometimes we use fractions as well. Uh, the physical states of the reactants and products must always be included in thermochemical equations because they influence the over amount, overall amount of heat exchange. For example, the heat needed to decompose water would be much greater than 483 if we started with ice in the solid state here instead of starting with it already in the gaseous state. Because if it was in the solid state, we'd first have to heat the water up to a liquid, then we'd have to put more heat into it to vaporize it into a gas, and then we could begin the decomposition reaction into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. So it would be a much more endothermic process if we started in a different state for water. So it's important that we state the states so that the correct balance equation matches the correct enthalpy value for that reaction. So we're going to look at thermochemical equations quite a bit in this section on bomb calorimetry. And it's uh, the bomb calorimeter part is it's kind of like important, but not as important as the thermochemical equations that go along with it. Because this is where you're going to learn how to connect the Q values that you get when you do your uh, calorimetry to the delta H values that you add to your thermochemical equations. So there's a lot going on in this section, but I'll try to break it down and dissect it for you. So a bomb calorimeter sounds pretty exciting, but uh, it's just a fancier version of a calorimeter. You can imagine that there's not a lot of coffee cup calorimeters going around in, in science labs. They're not going to be going around with their styrofoam cups um, trying to look all scientific. They have uh, professional grade calorimeters, which they call bomb calorimeters. The heat transferred in chemical and physical processes, processes is measured by an experimental technique called calorimetry. We already know that from yesterday. Calorimetry is often used to evaluate the heat of combustion of fuels and the caloric value of foods. In situations where combustion is involved, the traditional coffee cup calorimeter will not suffice due to limitations in the open air design and the accuracy of the instrument. Not to mention, you can't really have a combustion reaction taking place in a coffee cup calorimeter. Instead, a constant volume calorimeter, known as the bomb calorimeter, can be used where combustion is involved, or where maybe you're working with gaseous reactants and products, and they must be contained underwater. So constant volume calorimetry is basically your, your bomb calorimeter. Um, the bomb calorimeter gets its name because the reaction vessel where the contents are taking place is basically looks like a like a pipe bomb. You got a, a like a a metal um, pipe closed on one end, thread on the other end. You know, if you were to fill it up with explosives and ignite that, it would be a pipe bomb. But uh, instead of filling up with explosives, we're filling it up with some kind of fuel that you're going to measure. Maybe you want to measure the uh, uh, energy given off by the combustion of uh, methane gas, or maybe you want to figure out the energy given off by um, a bag of uh, Doritos. That's how they do it with food. They actually literally burn the food because that's what your body does. You, you do burn food. You give off carbon dioxide and water when you consume food. Um, you just do it at low temperatures. You're like low temperature combustion versus high temperature combustion, but the end result is still the same. So uh, they put, they put you know, your Doritos in here, they uh, put a little oxygen in here, they light them on fire, they let them burn, and uh, the bomb gets hot and it might build up pressure too. And if it builds up too much pressure, it would explode. Then what they do is they take the, uh, the bomb and they submerge it in a liquid. It could be water, it doesn't have to be water, but um, they calibrate it accordingly. 
And then as the reaction takes place underwater in that metal bomb, uh, it gives off the energy to the water, the water temperature goes up, and you can measure how much energy was released from that reaction. So it's just a more sophisticated heat transfer system. So uh, like I said, the, the bomb is placed in a water-filled container with well-insulated walls. Um, I've had students try to make bomb calorimeters for me before. Definitely more insulation than a uh, styrofoam coffee cup, but it's a bigger container. And then a bomb might look something like this. Um, metal container, something that can seal and be locked tight. Um, there's often ignition wires or electrodes that go in there so that you can create a spark and ignite it if they were closer. Um, anyway, after you fill up the bomb uh, with the substance that you want to, um, the sample that you want to burn, uh, you might pipe in some pure oxygen in there as well so that it has uh, enough oxygen to continue the combustion, give it an electric spark, and the reaction will take place underwater then. The heat generated by the combustion reaction warms the bomb and the water around it. The bomb, its contents, and the water are defined as the system. I almost want to say just the contents is defined as the system and the bomb and the water are the surroundings. That seems wrong to me. Let's just move this out. I don't think that's phrased properly. Because we're just focusing on what the reaction is producing and the bomb is absorbing that energy. To analyze the heat flow in a bomb calorimeter, we still use the same basic principle as we did yesterday. Whatever happens for the reaction is going to be the same magnitude of energy, but just the opposite <coughs> sign in the calorimeter. But there is one unique difference, and that is how they calculate Q for the uh, calorimeter. Because a bomb calorimeter is not just water by itself, like when they do, I gotta write this down. When they do the Q of the calorimeter for a coffee cup calorimeter, it's C, M, and delta T. Specific heat of the water, the mass of the water in the calorimeter, and the change in temperature of the water in the calorimeter. But with a bomb calorimeter, they do something a little bit different. And because the specific heat is not just for the water, but it's also for the metal of the bomb that the contents are in, you got two parts to the calorimeter. Um, they can't really give a single um, specific heat value for the, the calorimeter. And also because bomb calorimeters tend to be uh, like a stationary device that's not filled up and dumped every time you use it, uh, the mass of the liquid in the bomb calorimeter is something that's probably going to be uh, calibrated and standardized. So what they do is they combine these two pieces into what they call the heat capacity of the calorimeter and the delta T. And they basically bring these two pieces together. So what happens if you look at the units, CM would be specific heat and grams. And what they do is they combine those together and then the grams cancel out the grams. They standardize it that way and then they're just left with the energy per degree Celsius. So the bomb calorimeter um, has different units for its C. The bomb calorimeter is just in joules per degrees Celsius or joules per Kelvin or kilojoules we often use, but they're typically going to be giving you this information for the bomb calorimeter heat capacity value, but they are combining two pieces to make it into one equation. So whatever happens in the bomb is going to look like this over here on the right, and that's going to be opposite in sign but equal in magnitude to whatever's happening in the reaction that we put into the bomb. 
slightly different equation. The uh, C cal is the heat capacity, not the specific heat capacity, but just the heat capacity of the calorimeter. It depends on the amount of water in the bomb and uh, the material that makes up the bomb itself, the metal. Knowing the heat capacity of a calorimeter, the heat flow for any reaction taking place can be calculated. Uh, they always have to standardize the heat capacity of a calorimeter before it can be put into use. So what they do is they take a reaction of known energy and they calibrate the machine and they figure out what the C cal is for the uh, bomb calorimeter and then they use it over and over and over again. Reactions involving gases cannot have their energies measured in a coffee cup style calorimeter. Gases would escape, whereas in a bomb calorimeter, you can keep everything contained and it would be ideal for that situation. So let's look at how it works with the math and uh, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. The first part of this problem, A, is just the bomb calorimeter stuff. And the second part is how we're gonna get enthalpy involved in this whole process. So first we got a reaction, it's between hydrogen and chlorine gas, it makes hydrogen chloride gas. And we study this reaction in a bomb calorimeter. So we're getting a big clue that we're kind of using bomb calorimeter math. It's found that when we put a one gram sample of hydrogen gas into a reaction and react it completely in the bomb calorimeter, the temperature of the calorimeter goes up by 9.82 degrees Celsius. Taking the heat capacity of the calorimeter to be 9.33 kilojoules per degree Celsius, we want to calculate the heat involved, evolved in this reaction. So uh, here's that C cal that they're going to give to you. And again, it's basically taking into account the mass of the calorimeter and the specific heats of the parts of the calorimeter and it's making it into one constant for us to use. So Here's how I would start it out. Whatever's happening in it's gonna be that, call it the C of the bomb. They call it the C cal, I call it the C of the bomb. The heat capacity of the bomb and the change in temperature of the bomb. In this case, the Q takes, that takes place in the bomb calorimeter is 9.33 kilojoules Celsius, the final temperature 29.82 minus the initial temperature of 20. So we get a positive 91.6 kilojoules of energy that way. That's absorbed by calorimeter. Now, the reaction itself had to produce that energy. That's why the temperature of the bomb calorimeter went up. So if that's true, then Q of whatever's going on in the bomb is equal to the negative Q of whatever's happening for the reaction. So Q for the reaction taking place, the hydrogen reacting to make hydrogen chloride, is going to be the same magnitude of number, but it's going to be 91.6 with the negative in front of it. That's a release by the reaction. So very similar to a coffee cup calorimetry, except for the fact that that C bomb information is given to you and it's combined two pieces into one piece. So that's one thing in itself, just getting used to like how a bomb calorimeter works. But the next part is a really important part to me because what I want to do here is uh, show you how to the balanced equation get a thermal chemical equation, and we haven't done that yet, so let's make this happen. The enthalpy of the reaction, uh, 
delta H, the enthalpy of the reaction, delta H for the stated equation is what we're solving for. It's not really a question, it's a statement there. Um, so what I'm gonna do is say, I can do this one, I can do this one on three different ways. I'm gonna show you maybe two ways just to make this connect because I didn't exactly connect time last block. I'm gonna do this for one mole of hydrogen gas, hydrogen gas because that's how much is in the balanced equation. If I take one mole of hydrogen gas, because I need one mole of hydrogen gas in the balanced equation up above, I know that every one mole of hydrogen gas is 2.016 grams of hydrogen gas. I get that from the periodic table, molar mass. But then here's the neat part. In this reaction, that one gram of hydrogen gas produced 91.6 kilojoules of energy. So I can use that as a conversion factor. Minus 91.6 kilojoules for 1.00 grams of hydrogen gas reacting. And that gives me a value of negative 185 kilojoules. That's given off by that reaction. When one mole of hydrogen reacts, in that reaction, a minus 185 kilojoules of energy is produced. So that is per, I guess we could say per one mole reacting. That is the number that's gonna go up here. So by doing a bomb calorimeter thing with one gram of the sample, I can relate that one gram to the moles that are in the balanced equation and make that into a thermal chemical equation based on the mole to mole to mole ratio in that equation. I'm gonna show you something a little bit different because this came up last block and it was a really good question. They're like, but what if I had HCl? Why, why did I have to start with the moles of hydrogen? What about starting with the moles of chlorine or the moles of HCl? You could start with the moles of HCl. If I want to know what the thermochemical equation is for this, and I want to know how many, how much energy to make two moles of HCl, okay, I do that. I start out with two moles of HCl. Now, it is a balanced equation, right? Two moles of HCl react with one mole of hydrogen. And there's still 2.016 grams of hydrogen for one mole of hydrogen. And the reaction, the bomb calorimeter, still tells me that there was 91.6 kilojoules of energy produced when one gram of this hydrogen reacted. So, uh, you know, we get back to the same thing, minus 185 kilojoules of energy. They're all stoichiometrically connected, whether I focus on the moles of hydrogen, the moles of HCl, or even the moles of chlorine, they're all stoichiometrically connected. I chose in this one to take the most direct route since we were talking about hydrogen in the first place and take it right to that. But I could have started with anything in the balanced equation and then use the bomb calorimeter information to make the connection to the balanced equation. Take a look at another one of those on the next example. But this is a, I always feel like we don't practice this enough. So uh, on the last day, we go through some more of these kind of two to delta H connections. Example number two, very similar looking reaction, uh, iodine instead of chlorine in this case. Here we got a 239 gram sample of iodine. It reacts with a sufficient amount of hydrogen and lowers the temperature of the bomb calorimeter from 21.5 to 13.7. We are given the 
peak capacity of the bomb calorimeter in this case as well. And I can tell it's a bomb calorimeter because they give me that information and the units are different than what I would have for a, a normal coffee cup calorimeter. So the first thing I want to do is figure out what the Q is for the reaction. And I'm going to kind of treat it the same way I did the last time. If I figure out what it is in the bomb first, then I know the Q of the reaction is the same thing, but opposite sign. So we got uh, 6.4 kilojoules degrees. Uh, final temperature is 13.7, and initial was 21.5, so things get turned around a little bit that way because it's cooling the sample. This comes out to be negative kilojoules of energy. So all I know from that right now is uh, the bomb gives off gives off that much energy, and that's why the temperature of the bomb, the calorimeter, went down. Um, so then it's also true that if I'm looking at the reaction, that's negative whatever is going on in the bomb, then the Q for the reaction stays up here, 1050. So we got all the bomb calorimeter stuff out of the way. The second thing is to try to make this into a thermal chemical equation by relating our Q values to our delta H values. So. Um, Determine the energy of formation when one mole of hydrogen iodide gas is produced. So if I have one mole produced, what I want to do is uh, relate that to what I know from the calorimeter. I know how much iodine was reacting to make this temperature change. This is a uh, for 239 grams of iodine reacting. But I'm talking about moles of hydrogen iodide here, so I got to connect the hydrogen iodide to the iodine somehow. And that literally is going to be a little stoichiometry thing. Every two moles of HI reacts with one mole of iodine. And my Heat flow, my heat, uh, my 50 kilojoules is how much is produced when it's in grams of iodine. So I'm going to take my moles of iodine and put it back into grams of iodine. And uh, diatomic iodine has a molar mass of 253.8 grams of iodine per mole of iodine. And then I can use that thermochemical information. There's, for every 239 grams of iodine that react, 50 kilojoules of energy are absorbed. Positive 50 because it's an endothermic reaction. And that comes out to be a positive 27. I being formed that I produce. So that's the answer to that part of the question. But um, I want to do one thing additional. This is mental math for this part. If it's 27 kilojoules of energy to produce one mole of hydrogen iodide, what number do I have to put next to the balance equation up above to make that a proper thermochemical equation? 54 because every mole produces 27 kilojoules, but I'm producing two moles of HI, so this would be a positive value of 
54 kilojoules. So again, I'm trying to show you how, how that Q information can be brought up to the delta H information to make a proper thermochemical equation. Because Q by itself just relates to whatever random quantity of sample that you chose to burn or react. But uh, when we set everything to moles and adjust accordingly, we can link it to the uh, thermochemical equation. So this time, I chose to work with uh, the hydrogen iodide part probably mostly just because the problem was kind of set up to solve for HI anyway. But I could have uh, hydrogen or iodine were reacting and, and worked off of that. For example, if I wanted to know, um, if I wanted to just work off the iodine, I could have known, but I've got the information here. We've got, um, 239 grams of iodine. And uh, actually, I'd have to set that to one mole of iodine. So I could say, okay, if we have one mole of iodine, one mole of iodine is 253.8 grams of iodine for its molar mass. And every 239 grams sucks up 50 kilojoules of heat. And I could figure out the uh, energy for that and you're gonna see that it mathematically comes up to the same 27 kilojoules. So because they're all stoichiometrically connected, all you need to do is find the energy per one of those coefficients, and you can do it for the whole equation. Yes, um, wait, wait, wait. You're right, wait. What did I do here? That would come up to the 54 because I'm not dividing by two. And that's what the number should be. Thank you. So when one mole of this reacts, we get 54. Thanks for pointing that out. Good clarification. So again, this kind of thing here is really a big part of working with thermochemical equations and doing things with thermochemical equations. And you're only getting a couple examples here at the beginning and then you gotta wait again until we get a little bit further into it to use, use those again. Um, example three has got a little bit of a different flavor to it. But it's more focusing on the bomb calorimeter than anything. We've got hydrogen gas and methane gas, and they're compared as two potential fuel sources. So tests for each are carried out in a bomb calorimeter. And we know the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter at 11.3. We take a one and a half gram sample of methane and burn it in an excess of oxygen and we have a temperature increase in the bomb calorimeter of 7.3. Then we do the same thing with hydrogen gas and we get an increase of 14.3. We do have different quantities of hydrogen and methane. So we got to make sure we plug in the numbers and compare them on a level playing field. Ultimately, we want to calculate the energy of the combustion and methane. So I'm going to do a, for methane, I'll call it this. Um, for the CH4, 7.3, temperature changed by 7.3. I mean, since it's a combustion reaction, that was an increase in temperature of 7.3. <coughs> and that means there was 83 kilojoules of energy absorbed by the bomb. It's a positive value there. 
which then means that the Q for the reaction, I don't want to do it in red, the Q for the reaction of CH4 was a negative 83 kilojoules. That's why the temperature of the water went up. And then if we did the same thing for the Q of the bomb, but this time with the hydrogen in it, same bomb calorimeter, so the same heat capacity. This time it goes up to 14 point, by 14.3 degrees Celsius. We get uh, 162 kilojoules absorbed. Is a negative 162 kilojoules. So we know how much energy each produced, but the problem is we weren't comparing things on a level playing field. That's the energy produced for one and a half grams of methane and for 1.15 grams of hydrogen. So to level the playing field and do a per gram analysis, I am going to take the negative 83 kilojoules for 1.50 grams of CH4. and get negative 55 kilojoules per one gram of CH4. I suppose if I was paying attention to sig figs, I'd have to drop it down to two sig figs at this point. Thing for the hydrogen, this time for a 1.15 gram sample. Hopefully we get that answer. So now we can compare them on a level playing field. One gram of this field compared to one gram of that field. And what you find here is that this is about 2.56 times more energy per gram. So, uh, we heat our houses, for example, with methane gas, probably your hot water as well. Works out pretty well for us. But you would be able to get by with less hydrogen to get the same amount of heating done. It might blow your house up, but it's got more, <coughs> more bang for the per gram. Plus, methane has to be burned and it produces carbon dioxide and water and carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and blah, 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 blah. If you want to reduce your carbon footprint, then you would convert over to like hydrogen gas because when hydrogen gas burns, it just produces water vapor and that would rain more and it'd be humid all the time. And you'd complain about that. So pick your poison. You have a question, Nate? No, I'm just wondering, would that make 55 more than 41? So I just uh, simplify this ratio. Yeah, and I just looked at, to, you know, I took uh, 141 divided by 55 just to see how many times it went in there. It doesn't specify that I had to do that, but I just thought it was an interesting way of looking at it. All right. Last thing in section 6.2 refers to this idea of state functions. Um, and state functions is how we start out the next section. So let's take a look at this. Both internal energy, which is a bit on day one, 
college board isn't going to really play around with it too much. They're not so concerned about Delta E anymore. But uh, both internal energy and enthalpy share a significant characteristic. Changes in these quantities that accompany chemical or physical changes do not depend on the chosen path to go from the initial state to the final state. In other words, no matter how you go from the reactants to the products, the value of delta E or delta H for the reaction will always be the same. A quantity that has this characteristic is called a state function or a state property. See it written both ways depending on what text, textbooks I look at. So let's use water as an example for this. For a sample of water, where we have one gram of change the water from 24 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. 24 to 25. If you do that directly, heat the one gram, it would take 4.18, actually it would take 4.184 joules of energy to go from 24 up to 25 directly. But what if you took a different path? What if you first heated it from 24 up to 30? That takes 25.08 joules of energy. And then you cooled it from 30 down to 25. That releases 20.9 joules of energy. And how much energy did it take? Well, you absorb that much, you release that much, and the difference is still 4.18 joules of energy, even though you took a, took a different path to go there. Or maybe you start by taking 24 and cooling it down to 20. That releases a certain amount of energy, 16.72. Then you heat the 20, the one gram up, absorbs 20.9. Two different paths, but still 4.18 joules of energy to get there. So you can go up and down as many times as you want. It's still going to be. 4.18 joules to take one gram of water from 24 to 25. Note that raising the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius by three different routes and arriving at the same destination proves that delta H is a state function. I don't remember which one your book likes to use. The example obeys the law of conservation of energy. Which tells us that energy is neither created nor destroyed. 